All right, today we are in Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 13. And I want to start with this. I, I saw this article. I thought it was kind of funny. 11 things you're terrified of but shouldn't be. This is from the Huffington Post. And it starts this way. It says, Occasionally the things that come to elicit the most collective fear start as harmless mistruths and grow into full-blown sources of national paranoia. In times like this, we all just need to take a deep breath and stop to consider if we're being rational. You are almost definitely swallowing zero spiders while you sleep every year. As opposed to the dozens claimed in Schoolyard Legend, you're welcome. Logically, spiders don't want to enter a mysterious hole that's emitting warm air. Or for that matter, come near a living being that rolls around and moves unexpectedly. Also, you probably don't sleep with your mouth wide open all the time. Even if you do, swallowing just anything that comes into your mouth while you sleep isn't the only outcome to this encounter. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. And then it lists all of these other things that we tend to fear. You know, it's these popular urban myths. Things we fear, but they're highly overblown statistically. Like flying on, in airplanes. Harvard University did a study, and they found that you have a 1 in 11 million chance of a fatal airplane crash being involved in that. 1 in 11 million. Uh, and then there's sharks. The International Wildlife Museum said that you have a 1 in 3.75 million chance of getting killed by a shark. So really not that much to fear. There's bacteria. We're freaked out about bacteria, but I guess less than 1% is bad for you. Some is actually good for you. And some soaps we use are actually more harmful to us than good. And then other things that lists are cell phones at gas stations. You ever hear that one? Use a cell phone at a gas station, you'll blow up. Just go to any gas station, you'll, that'll be proved wrong instantly. You know, everybody's on their phone. Swallowing gum. Oh no. What's going to happen if you swallow your gum? Well, your body just moves out the undigestible materials. It just moves them out. Need I explain more? And then, uh, and then knuckle cracking, of course. Any knuckle crackers in here? Let's see if I get a good one here. There we go, yeah. Not harmful at all. It's only harmful if you're over vigorous with it and you dislocate your, your finger. So anyways, th this is how we operate as humans. We are, we're greatly affected by fear. Some things that we really shouldn't be too fearful of, we do fear. But did you know the converse is also true? There are some things that we should fear that we often don't, like temptation, for instance. Listen to this quote from English theologian of the 1600s, John Owen. He said, let no man pretend to fear sin that does not fear temptation also. These two are too closely united to be separated. He does not truly hate the fruit who delights in the root. Speaking of sin being the fruit and temptation being the root, temptation is the doorway that always leads to sin, which is rebellion against our Father God. And so that's why we should resist and fight temptation. Now to be clear, before we jump into this passage together, to be tempted is not a sin. After all, we're going to see Jesus tempted here. And we know that it's not a sin to be tempted if Jesus was tempted because Jesus was without sin. I like how it says it in Hebrews 4, 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was tempted, and that's the subject of today's text. And now as we jump back into our study of Luke, we have seen already that, that Jesus was sent from heaven to earth, and now as he begins his ministry, hell is going to immediately attack. So let's, let's get into the text together. First, let me pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your work in our hearts as we read this today. You preserve this word for us, God, for your glory and for our good. And so, Father, I pray that as we look to the example of Christ, we would be inspired and empowered to live for you, to fight temptation, to fight sin, to fight the enemy with your word, as we'll see Jesus does. In his powerful name we pray, amen. Okay, verse one, let's begin. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. So remember, this is coming right 
on the heels of Jesus being baptized. He's publicly starting his ministry. The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, an audible voice from heaven. God the Father says, this is my beloved Son. And so it's clear, this is the Messiah. He's starting his ministry. And then what happens next? Whisked away to the desert. Notice that it's the Holy Spirit who leads him there. And he's going to be tempted. This is the setting here. Look at this picture. This is a picture of the Judean wilderness. Not unlike our deserts out here, Enza Borrego. It's a bunch of dry hills and rocks. Uh, this is a place that David describes in Psalm 63 as a dry and weary land. And so as we think of Jesus getting away to the wilderness, it's not a nice little getaway. He's not going to Palm Springs. It's not like that at all. This is a trial. This is something that is going to be hard. And this is our first point today, that just because life may be hard right now does not mean that God has not led you there. Notice once again, it's the Holy Spirit who leads Jesus out there. A lot of times when we're going through stressful, painful circumstances, letdowns, we're maybe encountering opposition in life, uh, we start to think, you know what, maybe, maybe this is an indicator that I'm not where God wants me to be. You know, because this is a hard place I'm in right now. Work, situation, family situation. But I want you to notice this important detail that the Holy Spirit himself led Jesus into 40 days of brutal temptation and trial. And and Mark's account of the same story uses an even more forceful expression to describe this. Listen to this. Mark chapter 1 verse 12. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Like he was pushed out there. So God clearly led him there. God the Holy Spirit led God the Son into the wilderness. And so I think there's a biblical principle that can be drawn from this fact, even before we go even further into the story, that sometimes we're intentionally led into difficult seasons. Why? So that God will be glorified, which is something more important than our personal comfort and tranquility. And this is totally biblical. For example, James chapter 1, verse 2 and following says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. New Testament scholar William Lane put it this way. He said, true sonship is always established in the wilderness. And so Jesus, right at the start of his ministry, is going to undergo this period of trial and temptation. And in these 40 days in the wilderness, the purposes of God are being accomplished in Jesus' life. It's 100% God's will that he's there. He's in the very center of God's will for his life at this moment. So the question is, why? Why would God lead Jesus into this onslaught of temptation by Satan himself And uh, we've already talked about it. What did he just come out of in Luke 3? How did Luke 3 end? The baptism. Think about this. Jesus goes through the water and then goes out to wander in the wilderness. Does that ring any bells in your mind, biblical scholars in here? A water experience and then a wilderness experience. Yes, there's a a pattern that should sound familiar to you. Uh, Many scholars believe this is an echo of the book of Exodus. When Israel, as a nation, passed through the waters of the Red Sea and then wandered through the wilderness. Now, there's also that number 40. Jesus' trial, we're going to see, is 40 days. Israel, their trial was 40 years. And if you recall that story, over and over again, the people of Israel doubted. They grumbled. They fell into temptation. They compromised. They loved other things other than God. They followed other gods. And so... It's interesting how we're going to see Jesus in this passage. He seems to have this on the forefront of his mind, Israel's wilderness experience, uh, because we're going to see he constantly is quoting from this portion of Scripture as he fights three separate temptations from Satan. He quotes twice from Deuteronomy 6 and once from Deuteronomy 8. And this passage in the Gospel is fascinating because it's one of only a couple places in the entire Bible where an individual comes face to face with the devil, with Satan himself. The first is in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. 
They're in paradise, and they're tempted by the serpent. You know the story. They fall into the temptation, and they're banished from the garden into the wilderness. Now, Jesus, he's facing the same enemy. He's not in the garden. He's in the wilderness. But he's facing the same enemy in order to accomplish what Adam and Eve could not. So he can defeat the serpent and provide a way for mankind to get back to paradise. So I hope you're seeing all these amazing connections here. Let's get back into the text. Verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. What did we just read in Luke chapter 3? In the, in the last chapter... God the Father told Jesus, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now here comes Satan, a typical MO. This is the way he operates. He tries to get us to question God's words. He he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God. You see that? If you are the son of God. And he's trying to persuade him. And and you can almost view this as an insult. He said, let's assume That is true, that you are God's son for a minute. Why don't you tell this stone to become bread? And this is our our first point about the enemy today, is that Satan is strategic. Notice the strategy of our enemy here. He's strategic. And, And just backing it up, first of all, we need to acknowledge that Satan is real. He he's real. He's not some half goat creature. Uh, He's not some guy running around in red pajamas with a pitchfork. Little caricatures that we see in in pop culture. Not at all. What does the Bible say about Satan? 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And that's what he is. He's an angel. Satan is a created angelic being who rebelled against God and wants nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy the people of God. And so, so none of what happens in the spiritual realm is random. Rather, it is very strategic. It's not a coincidence. Satan is very intelligent. He's very well aware that we human beings are, are more prone to temptations at certain times in life. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul warns the church in Corinth. He says that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So he's scheming. Why does the enemy use temptation? Because he knows that we're not likely to let him in through the front door. Right? Imagine that. If he came right up to you and said, hey, let me into your life. I would love to destroy your family. I want to destroy your marriage. I want to turn you into a broken alcoholic. Burn all the bridges in in your whole life. You'd say, get out of here, freak. I'm not interested in that. But no, he, he comes around the back, right? He comes around the back. And he's strategic with how he tempts us into self-destruction through sin. Just like a good fisherman, he baits the hook. There's there's not a good fisherman out there who just puts a a bare hook in the water and expects to catch something. Instead, they use a a juicy piece of bait or a nice lure to put on the hook. And, And Satan's end goal is what? To lure us into sin. Uh, The Puritan Thomas Brooks wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, and he said this, he said, he that will play with Satan's bait will quickly be taken with Satan's hook. And I remember quite a few years ago learning this helpful acronym, and I wanted to share this with you. I've heard this used in a few different ways, but I think it's very uh, applicable to this topic of temptation. HALT, H-A-L-T, just like stop, something that you see and it should give you pause. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. These are four risk states that affect our mood and behavior, and I believe also susceptibility to temptation. Have you noticed this in your life? Times when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, your, your guard is down and you fall. Hunger. Some of us get flat out wicked when we're in this state. <laughs> you know, the horns start coming out before dinner you know the food's taking too long you have to wait and I thought this is funny that the word hangry you guys know that word hangry that's actually a legitimate English word now it's in the dictionary 
They just, they just put it in there. It means bad-tempered or irritable as a result of hunger. Is that you? Have you ever had to apologize? <laughs> Babe, I'm sorry for what I said when I was hangry. You know, I didn't mean it. So hunger and then anger. The Bible talks about this. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Isn't that interesting? There's a connection between unresolved anger in your heart, unrighteous anger, and the work of the enemy. And then lonely. Lonely, this just makes sense. You know, you're, you're by yourself, you're isolated, you're more susceptible to attack. Just like a lion pounces on an isolated zebra, Satan pounces on us when we're by ourselves and we start to think, you know, no one's around, no, one, no one's watching, no one's going to see this. Maybe you're traveling for work, you're in a faraway city, you're at home without the family, late at night, everyone's asleep, under cover of darkness, and the lion's prowling. 1 Peter 5 says this, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him firm in your faith. So the enemy attacks when we're by ourselves. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan on talking about this, but 1 Peter 5.8 says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. And it connects that directly to the work of Satan when we're not that way. I think we need to be careful how we use our Christian liberties in terms of things like alcohol. A mature believer knows that, you know, God made wine to, to gladden the hearts of, of men. It says that right in the Psalms. But he didn't make wine so that you get dumb drunk and do things that you shouldn't do. Look up things you shouldn't look up. Uh, look up people you shouldn't look up. So be careful. Be aware, church. Uh, don't use your, your liberty in Christ as a license to sin and get, get caught in that same old snare by the enemy. He's an expert at using that one. So be careful. Be sober-minded. You know, how, how much is too much to drink or whatever? You know. You, know, you don't know? Ask somebody else. They'll tell you. Hey, you're being a dummy right now. <laughs> okay? If you are giving mastery of yourself over to a substance, what do you think is going to happen? So beware, church. Beware. Uh, be careful of that one. All right. And then lastly, the T in halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Tired. Uh, this one is interesting. Did you know that sleepy saints are perfect victims for the enemy? I'm reminded of this story from Luke chapter 22. Remember this? And Jesus came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from the prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So I think this is uh, definitely a biblical principle as well. When we're tired, we can get tempted. Tempted to lose our temper with our, our loved ones, you know, spouse and kids after a long day. Tempted to cut corners, you know, be dishonest with things. Uh, tempted to think, you know, I deserve another strong drink. You know, I'm tired. Uh, we, we choose to do the wrong thing, sins of commission. We choose not to do the right thing, sins of omission, when we're tired. So all this to say, Christian, be alert. Don't let your guard down. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says... Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. So let's get back into our story in Luke. It looks like with the apparent exception of anger, it's noteworthy that Jesus has experienced each of the other three. He's hungry, he's lonely, he's alone, and he's certainly tired. So the enemy swoops in for the attack, as we would expect. He tempts Jesus. And, and there's a word here for devil in verse 3, and the devil said to him, that word devil in Greek is interesting. It's the word diabolos. 
You might hear that coming down into other languages like Spanish, diablo. Diabolos means one who throws against. So he, he's hurling what he's got at Jesus. Uh, that, that word is used 38 times in the New Testament, three times in the plural for people, slanderers, and 35 times in the singular for Satan, the slanderer. And, and that's what he's doing. He is throwing this at Jesus, and this leads to our next point, that Jesus, our Savior, knows what it's like to experience all kinds of temptation. He's had it all thrown at him. And Satan throws three different types of temptations at Jesus. We'll, we'll see. And they match the sequence of Israel's failures in the wilderness, which is pretty interesting. And they also line up with the three types of sin warned about in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And those are all still alive and well today. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And so let's examine temptation number one again, uh, which echoes the provision of manna story from Exodus 16. Let's read it again, verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Now this is a kind of a strange temptation I mean, I've never been tempted this way <laughs> to turn stones into bread. Why? Because I can't do that. Uh, it's not something I can do. But Jesus could have done it, right? Jesus totally could have done it. After all, he, he turned water into wine. He fed thousands with a few loaves and fish. He can certainly manipulate his own creation. Uh, and certainly he was hungry. Uh, but here's the rub. If he does this, it'll be because Satan told him to do it, not God. And it would be an act of his own self-interest to satisfy his hunger, to go in front of what God wanted and to try to satisfy himself. Now, maybe you can see how we can relate to something like this. Have you ever thought, you know what? God's not giving me what I want, so I'm going to go ahead and go get it myself. That's what this temptation is. It's the lust of the flesh. Uh, Satan is asking Jesus to do a manna-like miracle, but in so doing, renounce his trust in God the Father. And it's a temptation to put his physical urges ahead of obedience to God. Once again, sound familiar? And, and this is what we humans experience all the time, whether it be with food or drink or, or comfort, greed, lust. The temptation is to ignore what God wants and has ordered for our own good and put our physical urges ahead of his wisdom. And Jesus does not fall for this trick. Uh, he hits Satan with a quote from Deuteronomy 8, and he rightly responds to Satan, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to work on me. I'm not going to be like the children of Israel that complained that God wasn't giving them enough to eat. If my father wants me to eat, he's going to give me food. And he says, man shall not live on bread alone. Uh, the rest of that verse is actually left off in Luke's account. You can find it and the other gospel accounts are the same story. But it's certainly implied, it reads, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So, swing and a miss, Satan. So is he going to give up? Oh, man. Let me go tempt somebody else now. No, he doesn't do that. Here comes the second temptation, which seems to parallel the story in Exodus 32 of Israel's major sin, worshiping the golden calf. Let's look at that one. Verse 5. And he, Satan, led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. So Satan's temptation here is for Jesus to compromise and take a shortcut. You know, you can have the crown without the cross. You don't have to shed your blood for sinners. Just, just step into your kingdom now. Claim your throne now. And, and don't we know that the most dangerous enemy of the truth is not just a flat-out lie? Usually it's a half-truth. It's, it's almost truth. 
And so here's Satan in, in classic satanic form. He's presenting a half-truth to Jesus. On the one hand, what he's saying is true. Satan does have much power and influence in our present world. You know, in the creation, we were supposed to be given dominion over the world. And when we sin, it's like we abdicated that to the enemy. And, and Ephesians 2, verse 2, calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. In John 12, 31, Jesus calls him the ruler of this world. And so in a sense, yes, Satan does exert a lot of influence and authority in this sinful world. But on the other hand, Satan does not have ultimate or eternal authority. The Bible is clear. Satan is a rebel who's going to burn. He's going to wind up thrown into the lake of fire. And so you see, here's a, here's a temptation that's got a lethal lie wrapped in it. I've heard temptation described as a chocolate-covered grenade. Isn't that a, a vivid image? It looks good. So you take a bite, blows up in your face. It promises freedom, joy, satisfaction, but in its wake it gives shame, it gives guilt and bondage. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. And so we, we're, we're tempted with things like money, influence, power, popularity. If we just say or do that thing which dishonors God, but remember that none of those earthly treasures will matter on judgment day. And so here Jesus sees this temptation for what it is, and he quotes Deuteronomy 6 in response. Look at verse 8. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He's not going to worship any created thing. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Unlike the children of Israel, Jesus isn't going to fall for this. He's not going to fall for loving or serving anything or anyone more than his father. And so, boom, strike two for Satan. He's, he's going down. But actually, Satan isn't quite done yet. Satan's the lord of flies, and he's just like a fly. He's buzzing around, still pestering and annoying. And in a bizarre twist, it, it kind of looks like he makes a halftime adjustment here, uh, decides to start quoting the Bible himself. He's like, okay, Jesus is answering me with quoted scripture. Let me try scripture on him and see if I could trip him up in this way. Look at verse 9. Satan leads Jesus to Jerusalem. It says, And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I think this is perhaps the, the strangest part of this whole narrative. We have Satan and Jesus, they kind of seem to like teleport from the wilderness over to Jerusalem, to the pinnacle of the temple. And let me just show you a few images here of what this looks like. So what you're seeing here is a southeastern corner of the temple complex in modern day Israel. And that was just, you know, retaining wall for what was built on top of it. So it's high, and you can't see that the, where this picture is taken from is actually uh, from the south. And what you can't see is the Kidron Valley, which drops down from there. And so in Jesus' day, this would have been a dizzying height. Here's a, a model that they built of what that would have looked like back in the day. The historian Josephus describes it as sitting at a dizzying 400 cubits over the Valley of Kidron, which is about 600 feet or so. So a pretty serious drop. For perspective, that's a bit taller than the Washington Monument. This would have been where the royal portico and Solomon's porch met overlooking the Kidron Valley. So Satan escorts Jesus here, and then he quotes some scripture to him. Isn't that crazy? Satan quotes the word of God to the word of God. Psalm 91. It's like, what? Satan just is doing a Bible study? Is he a Christian now? What, is that what's happening? Hardly, okay, hardly. Uh, Satan is doing what many cultists do today. He's twisting scripture. He's, he's building a whole erroneous theology off of little fragments of verses that are taken out of context. He's making it seem like it's okay to test God when the reality is that the passage is about trusting God no matter what. 
if you go back and, and look at Psalm 91. Uh, and this is why it's so dangerous to cherry pick verses. This is why here at our church we're committed to go verse by verse so we don't fall into this trap. There are whole religions out there like, like Mormonism, like Jehovah's Witnesses that have been formed from out of context verses and you keep doing that and before you know it, pour yourself a glass of some poison Kool-Aid. Uh, that's what happens when you take verses out of context. So I want you, as a good student of the word, to compare whatever you're hearing here from the pulpit or out in the culture, out in the world, in all your conversations, compare that with the word of God. Read it for yourself. Learn how to properly interpret through careful, inductive study of God's word so you won't be led astray. And so Satan is tempting Jesus, misusing this verse. He pretty much is asking him to do a swan dive off the temple. And he's like, well, what's the point in that? And there are some scholars, and I think this is a pretty good theory, that this would be a, kind of like a messianic revealing stunt that Jesus could do. The last prophet before the silence was Malachi. Malachi 3, he opens up that chapter by saying, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And so the idea in this theory is that, hey, a spectacle like this, people are going to recognize that you're the Messiah. Isn't that what you want? Just do it. Don't worry. God will protect you. And what a spectacle that will be. And uh, this is an appeal to the pride of life. Once again, this temptation is to live life saying, my will be done, not thy will be done, God. And God never told Jesus to do this, right? The danger is in using God as a means to an end. Like he's a side player in the story. Do what you want, and and God will come along and and catch your fall. God, bless what I want. I'll live my life however I want, and I want you to bless it, God. I want to marry whoever I want, do whatever I want to do, think whatever I want to think. And, And would you bless that, God? And that's all backwards. No, God blesses his will not our will. We're to trust and obey him, not use him. And so how is Jesus going to respond? Look at verse 12. It says this, And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So here we see it one more time. Three out of three times, Jesus combats Satan and temptation with the word of God. Jesus here quotes once more from Deuteronomy 6. He's quoting scripture to combat Satan. And We can do that too. Have you thought about that? Jesus isn't doing something here that we can't do ourselves. Any believer can and should do this. It's our offensive, it's our preemptive strike against the evil one. Let me read this from Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse 13. It says, Therefore take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And some have rightly noted that's the only offensive weapon in the the armor of God, is the word of God. The others are defensive. So here is Christ striking out offensively with the word of God against the enemy. And 0 for 3, Satan strikes out. So then he's good, right? That's it. He departs forever and and they live happily ever after. Is that how that works? Look at verse 13. We'll wrap it up with this verse, a crucial verse in this whole story. It says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. (sighs) Dang it, (laughs) you know? Uh, And this is our last point today. Satan is very patient. We've seen today he's strategic, uh, but he's also very patient. We've already discussed he's a fallen angel, but he's certainly patient, oftentimes more patient than we are. And this verse is a profound glimpse into what our enemy is like. He uses the same tactics. Uh, He's really not all that creative, but he's always going to be coming back to strike again when the time is right. In the life of Christ, Satan's temptation didn't didn't end here. 
uh, continued on. And you really think at, at any point in his ministry, there's probably the temptation for Jesus to say, you know, forget this, man. I'm done with the crowds. I'm done fighting with these Pharisees trying to trap me in my words. I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm ready to just fast forward to the kingdom part and, and get this over with. And, and of course, Christ anticipating the whole time what he's going to experience in Jerusalem. The flogging, the mocking, ultimately the crucifixion. Uh, so there was certainly the temptation to, to give it all up. But he persisted throughout his ministry and, and he passed the test. Now Satan is very patient. I, I think of other figures in the Bible like David. He became king at 30 years of age. He had a great reign, lots of victories. But then you see him 20 years later falling into adultery sees a naked woman on the roof top next to him and and he falls this great king falls and so you know we got to be careful to not think that we're standing and then fall because satan is strategic and he's also very patient so how do we overcome and resist temptation if if it's daily How, how did jesus resist it and remember he was really human and he shows us how he overcame temptation it was by knowing believing and trusting the word of god I like what the psalmist said, Psalm 119.11, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. You want to combat the enemy? How much time are you spending in the word of God, in the Bible? Are you devoted? Are you focused? Are you preparing for the next attack? That's a way you can kind of view your time in the word. I'm preparing for battle here. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't know, believe, and trust God's word, You're toast. You're no match for Satan. You really aren't. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, But not greater is is you. (laughs) You're not greater. Satan can take you out. It's only for the spirit of God dwelling in us that we stand a chance. Uh, So we have to prepare ourselves for battle. And I know it's sobering. But also, I want to end today with some very, very good news. One more verse. This is from the New Testament. 2 Peter 2.9 says this, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. And I want that to be an encouragement to you. God is here for our rescue. And how does he accomplish this? How how does God accomplish this? He accomplished this in his perfect son. And as we've seen today, you know, there's no one like Jesus. He did what we could never do. He never compromised. He never chose anything over God. He overcame temptation perfectly. Thus, he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Adam, our first representative, lived in a perfect garden, but he fell to sin. But Jesus, who is the second Adam, overcame sin for us. And because of what he did, when we fall, we get to run to the throne of grace. Now let me read you that passage from Hebrews again uh, with the verses that come before And after what we read before, Hebrews 4, 14 and following. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Are you in a time of need today? Are you being owned by a sin in your life? Is temptation and sin owning you? Well, confess that to the Lord today before we come to his table and receive healing from God because of what Jesus did, because he overcame temptation and then eventually went to that cross, conquered sin, death, shame, Satan, all of that. Because he did that, Because he rose from the grave, we can confidently approach God now, even when we fail, knowing that God will give us rescue from temptation. So drag it into the light before the Lord. Be forgiven today. Jesus was faithful where Adam wasn't. Jesus succeeded where Israel failed. Jesus comes and he succeeds where everyone else in the Bible failed. He passed the test for us and he gives us his perfect score by faith. Is that good news? <laughs> That's gospel. One more verse and a quote and we'll close. 2 Corinthians 5.21 
he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want to end with this quote. Uh, It's from the late Pastor Tim Keller. And it just talks about the success of Christ in his role in this world. It says, Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed to us, that is, uh, credited to our account. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who, though innocently slain, has blood now that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void, not knowing whither he went to create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us. And when God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love from me, now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrificing him and saying, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love from us. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserved. So we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace to wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord, and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who, struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk leaving an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate and heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. Jesus is the real rock of Moses, the real Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain till the angel of death will pass over us, He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible is really not about you. It's about him. And so today, will you put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He's your only hope against the enemy, your only hope against your flesh, your only hope against the world. All of these enemies of our soul. But Jesus is our victor and our Savior and Lord. Will you acknowledge him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Christ who is victorious over the enemy, proved here in today's text and proved later by his conquering sin and death. He rose from the grave on the third day and he offers new life to all who would call on him for salvation. Father, I pray that if there's anybody in here today who needs to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they would not delay. They'd do so right now. And and pray to you, God, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. And I need saving. And I believe that in your great love, you provided a Savior for me in Jesus. And so I trust him now as my personal Savior and Lord of the universe. Forgive me and give me eternal life. Father, I pray that. And Father, for those of us who already know you, uh, would we never be too prideful in realizing that the, the enemy has schemes for, for our lives. You have a plan for our lives, and so does Satan. And he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So Father, make us wise. Uh, give us wisdom. Help us to stay in your word, which is our weapon against the lies of the enemy. Help us stay with your people, not isolated but protected within the flock of God. And Father, we pray for your indwelling Holy Spirit that although you intentionally lead us into difficult places for our benefit, uh, Father, we, we, we pray that the Holy Spirit would also give us power through the temptations that the enemy hurls at us. And so, Father, we give this all to you all this whole morning. And uh, now as we come to your table, we just thank you for Jesus who obeyed 
you all the way to the cross. Uh, he did it for us out of great love. In his name we pray. Amen.